G'day, it's Mark and welcome back to the channel and in today's Falcon History episode we look at the controversial AU. The AU Falcon was produced from September 1998 to September 2002. It was the sixth generation Ford Falcon and it was conceived under the project name of Eagle. And that development began in February 1993 after which point it gained the official code name EA169 in October 1994. Also under consideration at the time was a further development of the fifth generation Falcon, the EL platform, as an alternative, importation of the Ford Taurus, which happened anyway, but as a replacement, and even consideration of the Ford Crown Victoria or the European rear-wheel drive Scorpio. Another alternative that was under consideration was a, uh, a local development of the Japanese rear-wheel drive Mazda 929 platform due to Ford's stake in Mazda. All of these alternatives were eliminated in favour of a substantial redesign of a local platform due to concerns about how the Australian market preferred high towing capacity, large interior size and local employment. Part of this research included the fact that over 69% of Falcons were fitted with tow bars and the perception that rear wheel drive cars were better at towing. Other considerations were the limitation of the uh, alternatives in terms of body style options, sedan only in some cases or hatchback, whereas a sedan and a wagon were required and also no capability for a V8 engine in some of the other platforms. So a six cylinder and a V8 engine were a requirement of the program. Stylistically, the new generation of Falcon was uh, influenced by Ford's radically new uh, design language, which was called New Edge. If you look at the vehicle though, it was an amalgamation of uh, elements of the Taurus styling and also the GT90, the Ford GT90 concept car and it blended the two design styles together, which may have uh, resulted in some of the, uh, I suppose, the lack of uh, market acceptance with the final product on launch. The car certainly polarised uh, opinions in the terms of the buying public, uh, and there was definitely a preference in the marketplace for Holden's VT Commodore, which had a more organic design. The AU, though, did have a very efficient drag coefficient of 0 0.295 for the sedan, which was an 11% improvement over the preceding EL series, and 0 0.34 for the station wagon. For the first time in Falcon's history, independent rear suspension became available as standard on some models and optional on others. It also featured Australian production firsts, such as variable cam timing, VCT on some six cylinder models and an adaptive automatic transmission on the high performance T series vehicles with steering wheel gear shift buttons. Other key changes were that there was a 35 kilogram or 77 pound reduction in weight for the AU Falcon base car versus the previous EL, a 17.5% stiffer body shell, an 8% improvement in fuel consumption. The rounded off design of the vehicle was also designed to appeal more to women. And this proved to be a major misstep from Ford Australia's uh, briefing process in the design. Because Falcons to this point, if you look at, particularly from, you know, XR, XA, XD, uh, and EA, these all had, you know, broad shoulders, wide, more rectangular looking design uh philosophies and that was something that people equated with Falcon that wide stance so this rounded off design uh, did polarize people and it was not perceived by many loyal customers as what a Falcon should look like interestingly enough when you look at the rear of the vehicle and the taillight treatment you can also see that um, not that Mercedes-Benz was influenced by the AU Falcon but it's interesting to see uh, the design comparison between an AU Falcon from the rear three-quarter to a Mercedes-Benz 
CLS. And uh, you can see that that probably design philosophy was maybe a little bit ahead of its time. Also interesting to note was the uh, the font used on the badges for the uh, the Falcon, uh, Forte and Futura was influenced by the original design of the uh, XK Falcon uh, in terms of that flowing font. As I mentioned, independent rear suspension, a double wishbone design on an isolated sum frame was available as a extra cost option on Forte, Fairmont and S models. And it was standard on the Fairmont gear, the XR6 VCT and the XR8 models. The updated six cylinder engines incorporated advanced features such as VCT on some models, like the XR6 as an option, and also on the uh, Fairmont gear. Uh, a temperature sensor on, in the cylinder head, which uh, detected coolant loss and allowed the car to limp home by cutting uh, cylinders. That was a safety measure. The engine range comprised the base Intec model, which produced 157 kilowatts of power or 211 horsepower with a revised cylinder head featuring smaller valve stems, larger exhaust valves and different uh, rocker ratio, as well as a revised piston and longer conrod and a cast aluminium cross bolted oil sump with the same power output as the EL series. An uprated version was reserved for the XR6 and that produced 164 kilowatts or 220 horsepower. And that was thanks to a unique cylinder head, reshaped inlet port, redesigned exhaust ports, open combustion chamber shape to restrict the uh, pre-detonation from hotspot areas, a unique camshaft, higher fuel pressure, a recalibrated EEC5 engine management system. The VCT engine produced 172 kilowatts or 231 horsepower for the XR6 VCT. If you check out my uh, channel, you'll see that I've secured a uh, an XR6 VCT as a project. There was also a Windsor V8 and that produced 185 kilowatts or 248 horsepower. And that was carried over from the EL without major upgrades. Transmissions were improved for better shift feel and the automatic was recalibrated to better suit the upgraded engines. The six and eight cylinder engines had the four speed BTR M93 LE and M97 LE automatic transmissions respectively. The automatic XR models had an adaptive shift with five shifting strategies depending on driving conditions. The AU program cost Ford Australia $700 million. Could argue it cost them a lot more than that in sales that they lost. Uh, key design staff included Steve Park, uh, Graham Wadsworth and Marcus Hot Black. And uh, I had the privilege of working with uh, both Graham and Marcus during my time at FPV. Jack Nasser was the main uh, supporter of the AU program and uh, would fly from the US because he was heading up uh, Ford Motor Company at that point fly back between uh, Australia and US on a regular basis to review the uh, updates uh, on how the car was coming along as it was in clay uh, and was even a big fan of the uh, AU Forte 1 grille uh, which reminds me of a baleen whale. Uh, some other people regard it as a, a salad uh, slicer. Uh, it had a bit of a mercury look uh, from my point of view. I thought it looked a bit like a mercury. But uh, yeah, that probably grated with people most of all from a styling point of view, uh, those sort of very sharp lines. And then I think the rounded sort of shoulders of the vehicle, but that front grille in particular, um, I actually like. And in fact, if you look on my channel, I've got a Series 1, uh, very, very rare WA uh, uh, Police V8, uh, AU1 Forte V8 uh, Police Pack. Uh, check that episode out if you uh, haven't already seen it. But um, I actually kind of like it because it's a bit bit unusual. The Series 1 AU was launched in September 1998 and that remained on sale until there was a major upgrade in April 2000. And it was marketed under a new slogan, I've come a long way, baby. The range consisted of the Ford Falcon Forte sedan, the Forte Wagon, 
the Futura sedan, the Futura wagon, the Falcon S sedan, the Falcon XR6, the XR6 VCT, the XR8, the Fairmont sedan, the Fairmont wagon, the Fairmont gear sedan, and uh, that was available in a VCT6 or in uh, a 5 litre V8. Uh, the V8 was also available in uh, the other models. Falcon Forte was a replacement for the old uh, GLI designation and it was designed and marketed to really attract fleet buyers. That was the entry level vehicle. Uh, when the car was released, it was very competitively priced at $30,690 and that included uh, automatic transmission and air conditioning, which uh, at the time were generally options on, on cars, including the BT Commodore. The uh, Forte, as I said before, was available with a uh, six-cylinder engine, 157 kilowatts, uh, 211 horsepower, uh, and 357 newton meters of torque, or 263 foot-pounds. It was also available with the optional Windsor uh, V8, and that was 175 kilowatts, or 235 horsepower, 395 newton meters of torque, or 291 foot pounds. The Forte and the other uh, models like the Futura and the XR6 also had the uh, amber indicators uh, and the Forte had the aforementioned uh, baleen whale or salad shaver type grill and then uh, as you went up the model range you went to the uh, Futura which had a different more horizontal themed grill that was more of a family oriented uh, safety package along the lines of the uh, Commodore Acclaim. And that differed from the uh, Forte in as much as it had uh, body coloured grille, standard anti-lock brakes, cruise control, alloy wheels, uh, digital clock fitted to the centre console uh, for Series 1 only. And that car priced at $34,990. Next in the range was the uh, Falcon S uh, for sports sedan. It's only... Uh, was not a very popular car and very few of those were sold. It certainly wasn't uh, marketed heavily like the previous S packs in uh, previous Falcon models. It was based on the Forte and it was designed as sort of an entry level sports themed vehicle. Uh, it had a body coloured uh, front grille, alloy wheels, S decals on the rear quarters and the boot lid and a high level spoiler. And colour choices were restricted to Venom, which was red, uh, liquid uh, silver, white, galaxy blue, and silhouette, which was black. Ford also offered an ESP option pack that added a limited slip diff uh, and IRS and ABS to the S pack. I think what a waste of a, an ESP uh, designation. I will cover off uh, ESP as we get to FG uh, in the next uh, upcoming episodes. Next in the lineup was the uh, XR6 Falcon, and this featured a unique uh, front end treatment with uh, four round headlights, a uh, unique front bumper bar. It had the low series uh, bonnet and a single slot grill. At the back, uh, it had a rear spoiler with uh, integrated uh, stoplight, alloy wheels, sports suspension. The XR6 had the four liter HP Intec six-cylinder engine which put out 164 kilowatts or 220 horsepower and 366 newton meters or 270 foot-pounds of torque. Next in the lineup was the Falcon XR6 VCT and that had the Intec VCT engine with 172 kilowatts or 231 horsepower and 374 newton meters or 276 foot-pounds of torque. Then came the Falcon XR8, and that was fitted with a five liter Windsor engine that had 185 kilowatts or 248 horsepower and 412 newton meters or 304 foot-pounds of torque. 
The Fairmont Gear was also available with a 5-litre Windsor V8 engine, and that put out 175 kilowatts, or 235 horsepower, and 395 newton metres of torque, or 291 foot-pounds. The XR series, as I mentioned, had a unique front bumper treatment with the four round headlights, plus all XRs could be fitted uh, with an option of a full Tickford body kit and a unique biplane rear spoiler. The biplane rear spoiler was no doubt influenced by the uh, UK Ford Sierra and uh, also the Ford Mustang SVO. The Fairmont range, uh, per the EF and EL, had uh, unique uh, front grills, unique uh, bonnet. They also had the uh, the red and white tail lights as opposed to the amber indicators to uh, increase differentiation from the uh, level one models. Fairmonts also had unique dashboards uh, with a high series uh, wood grain treatment, unique 15 inch wheels, uh, dual horns, Fairmont badging on the boot lid and an analog clock. Uh, the Fairmont was offered in sedan and wagon body styles. Above the Fairmont was the Fairmont gear, which uh, had the VCT engine as standard. It also included 16-inch alloy wheels, uh, traction control, four-channel ABS, 250-watt audio system with a separate amplifier and 11 speakers, and uh, the wood grain uh, dashboard per the Fairmont, plus uh, also wood grain uh, look on the door inserts. From a safety perspective, the Futura XR and Fairmont models all had ABS brakes in addition to a driver's airbag, which was the only main safety feature on the Falcon S and the Forte. The brakes featured a 287 by 24 millimeter vented front discs with 287 by 10.5 millimeter solid rear discs. It's safe to say that the, uh, the disc brake system on the early AUs was somewhat lacking. Inside, the Fairmont and the XR models featured full instrumentation with oil and uh, battery uh, or ammeter gauges. They also adopted, uh, as I said before, a different dashboard in the Fairmont and the gear from the uh, low series cars. The Falcon in its standard form had a uh, an overloid sort of pod in the uh, middle, which I think was more reminiscent of what you'd expect to see in something like a Tarago. And that was not well received by the market. Uh, it did look a little bit cheap and nasty. And uh, as I said, the uh, styling of that particular interior feature looked more at home in, a, uh, in something like a Tarago. The XR6 VCT and the Fairmont Gears featured special uh, Intec engines, as I mentioned earlier, and they were produced by uh, Tickford Vehicle Engineering. Uh, that variable valve timing was developed by Tickford in conjunction with a company called uh, Unicia Yex or Jex, J-E-C-S, who also supplied Jaguar for its V8 engines. IRS was also fitted as standard on the Falcon uh, XR6 VCT, the XR8 and the Fairmont Gear and it was optional on all other sedan models. Despite competitive pricing and high standard equipment relative to its rivals, especially for the uh, new entry level Forte, sales of the AU did not match those of the previous EL Falcon. This was mainly due to the uh, lack of enthusiasm from customers on that new edge styling. Ford had done a number of clinics and uh, they were trying to make the car appeal more to women by rounding off the uh, the vehicle to make it look smaller. The problem is that men who traditionally bought the cars were put off by the, uh, I guess, almost the non-Falcon styling. They were used to a more of a rectangular uh, design theme going through the Falcons, uh, particularly since the XR right back to uh, 66. And that had been a theme that, that had been consistent throughout the generations. And the reality is that uh, the women that drove Falcons probably liked uh, Falcons for the same reasons that the men did anyway. And um, there wasn't really a market for women looking for a Falcon-sized car. Uh, most women were buying, you know, smaller cars, lasers, uh, Telstars, things like that. Uh, they weren't interested in um, a larger car like a Falcon. Or if they were, they uh, appreciated it for the same virtues as men did.
In May 1999, the AU range received a minor update, introducing a larger brake booster, front power windows for the Forte and the XR6, and lowering the rear suspension of non-XR variants by 24 millimetres. To heighten its interior quality, the Forte was offered with a medium graphite interior trim, which was slightly darker than what was offered originally. And the pattern seat material was changed uh, from the bolsters to the seat centres. Buyers were also able to order a darker warm charcoal colour scheme uh, that was available on other Falcon variants. The only limited edition that was launched during this uh, first series was the Falcon Classic in June 1999. By then I was uh, at J. Walter Thompson at the advertising agency. I'd moved on from Holden and I found myself uh, marketing the AUs and um, it was certainly a challenge. There was a lot of buyer resistance. A lot of traditional Ford customers had gone to uh, the Holden showrooms on the VT Commodore. They saw that as a much more attractive car. The cars were trading hands, uh, you know, Commodores for you know more than $1,000 over what the Falcon prices uh, were going for. But customers wanted um, the style that they were really looking for rather than just a value uh, equation. The Falcon was never really a, a budget price offering. It was, you know, it was purchased on its own merits and it wasn't a discount type vehicle. So the Falcon Classic was introduced and I remember uh, conversations about, you know, Ford was saying, what can we do to make the car more acceptable? The um, the salad slicer grill was certainly a, a big negative uh, and I think the clinics had showed that as well. In fact, uh, I should mention that Ford had done some early clinics and very early on there was a lot of appetite for something a little bit different and a little bit fresh. But by the time Ford did the clinics uh, just before launch, they had a lot of uh, customer resistance to the styling of the vehicle, and this really was quite ominous as to what was to happen down the track. So to overcome this on the Falcon Classic, they changed the uh, grill, uh, the salad slicer grill, to uh, an egg crate grill that was taken from the uh, the Falcon commercial vehicles, the Utes, and uh, colour keyed. The car also had dual airbags, ABS brakes, cruise control, an upgraded sound system, the warm charcoal interior, which is the darker interior, which looked a little bit, you know, higher uh, level than the earlier very light grey trim, which looked a bit cheap. A power aerial, uh, special seat trim, 15-inch alloy wheels, low-profile rear spoiler, bumper inserts, and um, it had a recommended retail price of $30,690. So it was a very good value car for the money, and it was really... Uh, I think, reflective of what Ford was uh, doing because it had reached some desperation to maintain sales volume and um, the, the Classic was designed to do that. I mentioned uh, the utilities before and I think one of the high points of the AU range, even at launch, was the uh, the Falcon utilities and the cab chassis. Now, the, um, the Falcon was offered in uh, the XL, the XLS, the XR6 and the XR8 in terms of the utility models. And then there was a cab chassis model and a cab chassis with um, factory fitted drop side tray. This was the first time that a, uh, a cab chassis had been offered in uh, the Falcon range. And it was uh, certainly something that Holden had offered in the past with its old uh, Holden One Tunners, which were very, very popular, but it had been uh, off the market since the demise of uh, the WB series. Um, and even though the, the AU Falcon sedans had been rejected in, by many people, uh, the utilities and the uh, cab chassis were actually embraced by uh, tradies and business people alike. They didn't seem to have the same uh, rejection on the commercial vehicles that they were finding with the uh, sedans. You know, the one ton carrying capacity uh, was uh, something that was really useful. The cab uh, space, the storage behind the seats, you know, and that six-cylinder or V8 performance, because the V8 was also available as an option, it really uh, put Ford in a great position. Ford was really trying to address, you know, a lot of the issues and the rejection of the market uh, on the AU. So uh, in April 2000, uh, they launched the Series 2 model. And this included uh, the high series raised bonnet from the Fairmont models that was actually applied across the board 
to all of the Falcons to square up the, the vehicle. They were trying to really square the car up, make it look wider and, and beefier and stronger. It had a more conventional and common uh, front grille treatment. And the Forte and the Futura now had pretty well the same grille. They increased the depth and width of the rear bumper, as I said, to square that up, off. To give it that broad shouldered Falcon look. Uh, there was a laminated firewall, uh, increased uh, under carpet asphalting and rubberized engine mounts. And that was designed to reduce uh, noise, vibration and harshness. There was also an upgraded braking system, which I'll get into in a minute. 16 inch wheels in lieu of the previous 15 inch wheels. And that was because of the larger twin piston uh, calipers. Uh, lower ground clearance uh, with new shock absorbers and uh, ball joints. Again, bringing the car down, trying to get rid of that very tall, ungainly appearance. They were trying to make the car look more hunkered down to the road. Uh, also higher quality interior plastics, uh, less of that oval central dashboard look with uh, silver highlights. Standard cloth in lieu of uh, vinyl finishes and uh, increased use of that darker warm charcoal with the interiors. There's also upgraded sound systems and an upgraded smart shield security system with a transponder located in the key in lieu of the previous smart lock, which, um, and the problem with the smart lock was that couldn't uh, prevent theft if you copy the keys. Also standard front airbags across the full range. There are also body strength increases. And that was aimed at improving uh, occupant safety and the Falcons uh, rating it in the independent ANCAP crash testing program. In those tests, it received uh, three stars for adult occupant protection rating with a score of 24.2 in the offset crash. And it was found that there was a low risk of injury to all bodily regions, including the driver's foot and lower leg due to excessive brake pedal movement. So new safety features included an airbag, seatbelt pre-tensioners with load limiters on the front seats across the range. Wagons were fitted with a three-point lap sash uh, rear centre seatbelt with a retractor integrated into the seat back. As I mentioned, the braking systems were upgraded and so these now featured uh, thicker front and rear discs, twin piston aluminium headed uh, front calipers, bigger non-asbestos brake pads, larger master cylinder and a higher capacity booster. The discs were now ventilated, uh, 287 by 28 millimetres at the front and solid uh, 287 by 16 millimetres at the back. The XR6 VCT and XR8 were also available with the optional Tickford premium brake setup that uh, provided uh, 329 millimetres grooved front brake discs with twin piston C4 calipers. Additional features included the introduction of a 100 watt stereo with a single slot CD player, variable intermittent wipers and door lock unlock button on the instrument panel, and an equipment upgrade such as standard air conditioning, front power windows and automatic transmission on the automatic forte to shrug off the initial impressions that the car was a bit of a low budget uh, vehicle. And also across the range, Ford now offered a three-year, 60,000-kilometre uh, scheduled servicing uh, warranty. The range continued with the Falcon Forte sedan and wagon in six-cylinder or V8. The Falcon S, which was a four-litre uh, six-cylinder. The Futura, which was again a four-litre six-cylinder in sedan and wagon. The Fairmont uh, sedan and wagon, available in uh, six or V8. The Falcon XR6, the XR6 VCT, the XR8 uh, 5 litre, which had uh, now 200 kilowatts of power. And that was um, actually to April 2001. And then that was further upgraded uh, from May 2001 to 220 kilowatts. So uh, 200 kilowatts to April, which was... 270 horsepower and 420 newton metres of torque, which is 310 foot-pounds. And then the cars went up to 220 kilowatts from May 2001, which is 300 horsepower and 435 newton metres or 321 foot-pounds of torque. 
All XR models were available as sedans only, as was the uh, the Fairmont gear, uh, which had the VCT engine, uh, which was carried over with the 168 kilowatts, and the Fairmont gear with the 5 litre Windsor V8 at 175 kilowatts. Also from July 2000, there was the introduction of a dedicated LPG, liquid petroleum uh, gas engine, and that was marketed as an Intec e-gas uh, option. It had a single point Venturi style carburetor rather than sequential fuel injection as per the petrol engines. Other differences included different spark plugs, inductive uh, high tension leads and a unique engine management processor. The sedans were fitted with a 92 litre LPG cylinder while wagons had a 115 litre tank. Sedan based limited editions included the X Pack, which was a Forte upgrade with a choice of uh, two ROH alloy wheel designs from the Ford accessory lineup as standard and the original XR re rear wing. The SR, which was a Forte based uh, S successor, now with ABS, that was available also in a, uh, a V8 or a 6, uh, quite a rare car if you see one of those on the market. There was the Futura Classic. Uh, and then there was also the Futura and Fairmont Gear 75th anniversary sedans. And that was to commemorate Ford Australia's birth in 1925. There was also uh, an XR8 Rebel, uh, which was a limited edition, which had a Ford racing uh, body kit, 18-inch wheels, Momo steering wheel and gear shift, and a Sony PlayStation 2 with uh, Gran Turismo 3. In the Ute range, there was uh, some limited editions. Uh, there was a carryover of the XL, the XLS, the XR and the XR8, but there was some limited editions, uh, a tradesman model in the XL, and in the XLS, there was a sports edition and a Marlin. I've actually got a couple of uh, AU2s. So I've got a very rare uh, Fairmont V8. Check out the channel. There's uh, plenty of episodes uh, on that car including a couple of road trips and some general walk around videos. And I've also got my, uh, my uh, car that I saved from uh, a drift, uh, Fate Worse Than Death, which was uh, a VCT AU2 uh, XR6 five-speed manual. That's got the VCT engine, the IRS, it's got the Tickford wheels and, you know, definitely a car worth saving. So check those episodes out if you haven't already. The final version of the AU was the Series 3, and that was released at the Sydney Motor Show in November 2001. And uh, the main changes there were the discontinuance of the Falcon S, a limited edition uh, XR6 VCT ST, which had a unique Ford Racing body kit from the XR8 Rebel, and a Falcon XR8 Pursuit 250, uh, by Tickford Vehicle Engineering, which had a 250 kilowatt uh, engine upgrade. Externally, the Series 3 vehicles were distinguished by body coloured mirrors and side strips, plus standard side skirts and different wheels on some models. Uh, headlights became a shade darker uh, in terms of the surrounds. Uh, side indicators were clear, and then there was a dot matrix windscreen that was added to reduce sun glare. In terms of the interiors, additional features were added as standard. So the Futura had uh, rear power windows and velour trim. The Fairmont gained a six-way power adjustable driver's seat and the Fairmont Gear gained a 10-way power adjustable driver's seat and leather trim. Uh, though ABS had become standard across the range, the XR models lost some equipment. The XR6 uh, limited slip diff was now optional. Uh, and all XRs had a stereo downgrade to a four-speaker single CD unit. Uh, there was a body kit available, uh, marketed as Havoc, uh, H-A-V-O-C, uh, which had a new front and rear bumpers, which featured uh, stainless steel mesh inserts, fog lights, uh, side skirts, and optional rear spoiler. Looked quite good, actually. It was quite a good package. And that kit became optional on all Falcons, uh, with XR8 buyers also having the choice of a Tickford body kit or a Ford Racing body kit, uh, originally featured on the AU2 uh, Falcon XR8 Rebel. Uh, Fairmont and XRs could also be optioned with a Rex uh, Rear Entertainment Extreme package, which allowed uh, rear passengers to play uh, DVD movies or connect with uh, their game consoles.
Now, I've got to mention during this period, there's also the FTE T-Series cars, the T1, uh, which coincided with uh, Series 1, T2 for Series 2, and T3 for the final uh, Series 3. And, you know, due to inadequate sales of the Ford Performance sedans compared to HSV, and I remember when I was at HSV, you know, we would be selling, you know, maybe 300 vehicles a month, and you'd see the Tickford sales, it'd be like, you know, 12 and 15 cars. There was really no comparison. You know, particularly uh, once HSV got the uh, the Chevrolet 57 V8 engine, that was extremely popular. So Ford really had to do something uh, about that. In the T1 models, um, look, I think they were pretty underdone from a differentiation point of view. I think there was quite an English philosophy, I think, at play there, more of a Q car, very understated, but I don't think that was really what the market in Australia wanted. You know, it didn't pass what I would say is the 50 metre test when people walk you know, see that car at a distance, they want to be able to say, wow, there's a, a GT or there's a Tickford or there's an HSV. You know, you've got to be able to hit that, you know, 50 metre test. And if the car doesn't stand out strongly enough, it's not what the buyers are really looking for, you know. So in the range, there was a, a TE50, which had the Synergy 5000 V8, which was 200 kilowatts or 270 horsepower and 420 newton metres of torque, which is 310 pounds. And then there was the TS50, which is the more luxury version, and that was a 5 litre V8 uh, with 220 kilowatts, 300 horsepower and 435 newton metres of torque uh, or 321 foot-pounds, and that was available in automatic only. Ford also launched at this time the FTE or the you know, the Ford Tickford experience. Uh, again, I think it missed the mark. It just was a little bit too subtle for that audience. You know, that muscle car market, people really want to stand out. It's got to have a bit of attitude. And I think FTE, it just didn't, it didn't conjure up any imagery. And we certainly uh, rectified that in a big way once we launched Ford Performance Vehicles. You know, we had the Falcon Bird of Prey as a central part of the branding, and that really did make a big difference. It just it just lacked some some get up and go and some and some real uh, heart. At uh, T2, there was the TE50 again with the Synergy 5000 V8, 220 kilowatts, 300 horsepower, and uh, the TS50 again. That also had 220 kilowatts or 300 horsepower, 300, uh, 435 newton metres or 321 foot-pounds of torque. Uh, again, I think the cars were, they were just too underdone for what the market was looking for. T3s uh, were finally getting closer to what the market was looking for. I think visually still not quite right. Uh, you know, and I think what Ford wasn't doing at this point was leveraging its wonderful GT heritage. And again, we did that with FPV once that was launched. But at this point, it, it, it wasn't really taking advantage of that great Ford uh, history. Um, but the TE50s had the uh, the 5.6 litre Windsor V8. And I'll talk about that in more detail in a minute. But the TE50 had 250 kilowatts of power. 335 horsepower and 500 newton metres of torque, which was 370 foot-pounds. And then there was the TS50, which was the more luxury version with the same uh, engine output. So as I said, uh, you know, the T-Series cars were struggling and, and, you know, and really inadequate sales compared to the, uh, the HSV product. Uh, it was a joint venture between Ford Australia and Tickford Vehicle Engineering. And um, there was the short wheelbase, if you like, you know, Falcon based TE and TS 50s. And then there was a TL 50, a long wheelbase car. I won't get into that now because I'm going to do a separate series on fair lanes, uh, which will include those. So I won't get into that now. But in addition to the higher mechanical specifications and performance, the range also benefited from FTE, uh, premium assist and enhanced ownership benefits. So between uh, 1999 and 2002, there were three T-Series vehicles, as I mentioned, T1, T2 and T3, which uh, coincided with, you know, AU1, Series 1, Series 2 and Series 3. 
The power plants were modified Windsor V8s, uh, as I mentioned, renamed Synergy 5000, and they were hand-built and featured in engraved plaque, uh, which bore the, uh, the name of the engine builder. So that was quite nice, quite bespoke. Over the AU2 and AU3 period, the production of the Windsor was uh, phased out, and the remaining units were shipped to FTE across the road, uh, where I used to work there at, uh, near the factory at Campbell Field, and FTE then went on to produce what was the most powerful, naturally aspirated, electronically uh, fuel-injected Windsor V8 engines in the world. And they uh, used those for the uh, the Falcon XR8 sedan, the Pursuit 250 utility, and the last batches of those engines, which were called the Windsor Stroker, uh, were used in the uh, TE and TS50s, uh, the T3s. And uh, they were bought out, as I said earlier, to 5.6 litres. And the TE50 was available with a five-speed manual or a four-speed automatic. And the TS50 uh, was available as an automatic only. They had electronic sports shift uh, ESS. This was a feature, of, uh, an Australian first uh, on an, an Australian production car, where they had the steering wheel uh, mounted buttons that permitted uh, manual gear shifts. Inside all models featured a Momo steering wheel and that could be optioned up with uh, upgraded Brembo braking systems. Externally, as I said before, they were aimed at a more sophisticated look compared to the HSVs, but I think HSV really, I've got to say, did a much better job in terms of that differentiation, that uniqueness. The the T-Series cars, now, I think, look better now as an older vehicle, you know, they are becoming more appreciated. But at the time, they did really struggle uh, up against uh, the HSVs, and that's just the way it is. I mean, whether, whether you're a Ford fan or a Holden fan, it doesn't really make a lot of difference. The fact is those cars did struggle when they were new in the market. They've now really come into their own, and they're, they're starting to acquire a much more um, popular base. And it's a little bit like what we talked about the other day, if you look at the the uh, ELGT episode if you haven't checked that one out check that out in the series but you know some of these cars didn't meet with you know they met with buyer resistance or a lack of you know demand or success but then as the cars become older you know they do sort of get fall into their own groove and become quite popular and that's where we're at now I think um, but the cars did have distinctive front end and, and rear styling they were highlighted by a chrome mesh grill 17 and 18 inch wheels uh, on the TE50 and the TS50, respectively. Uh, they had discrete low-profile rear spoilers for the T1 series, but again, two underdone. T2 saw the TE50 feature an XR-style rear wing, and then TS50s retained the low-profile version of the spoiler. So again, more discrete. And I did apply that sort of philosophy when I was at FPV, when I did the 4.6 and the 4.8 vehicles, but they were sort of niches within niches, very low volume, um, because we still had the GT and we had the Typhoon to, um, to, you know, to generate the, the main volume in those segments. All T3 models featured 18-inch wheels and they had a louder um, V8 you know, supercar-inspired body kit uh, with a high-profile rear wing that was definitely influenced by the racing cars. I do remember when I was at FPV, we still had some uh, T3 cars in dealer stocks and we were really trying to shift those and we put some pretty big, big bonuses on those. I remember having a meeting with... Uh, uh, Jeff Polides and the uh, Ford finance director to you know to get some serious bonuses to help those to help dealers move those cars so that deals could you know could offer a good uh, over allowance in other words offer more money on trade ins uh, you know to to basically shift the cars and that did work quite well we were able to to uh, move on the last of the T threes. Special show car that I'll mention, which wasn't a production car, but was the Hillier Coupe. So in 2000, the Hillier brothers created a two-door AU Falcon Coupe. That was based on an, uh, a Forte uh, ex-police car. And I should mention, you know, Falcon still, even at this time, were still very popular as taxis and as police cars, those mainstream sort of, you know, more uh, utilitarian uh, type uses were still, you know, Falcons were still doing quite well in those segments. But the Hilly brothers created this uh, AU uh, coupe, and that was for the Summer Nats uh, 
which is like a, a you know muscle car, uh, custom car festival. And uh, the following um, uh, year, they did a deal with Ford Australia, and um, the green car then became a red uh, concept 300 plus, and that debuted at the 2001 Melbourne Motor Show. There was uh, talk of making a very limited run of these uh, coupes, 100 Hillier coupes. They planned to sell those for about $135,000. Orders were taken for up to about 20 cars instead of the original 100. So Ford then left the project and it killed it off, basically. Uh, Three coupes were built. There was the Ford 300 Plus concept car, an Autotech Arrow Coupe, and also a red XR8 Coupe. From a motorsport uh, perspective, there were AU Falcons that competed in the uh, V8 Supercars uh, series, but no uh, AU won uh, Bathurst. There were some victories in some of the uh, smaller level races, but yeah, no Falcon AU uh, won Bathurst. Total production of the AU Falcon totaled 237,000. 701 units, well down on the run rate that was achieved by the previous EL. I thought this was very interesting. As of 2020, there were 44,816 AU Falcons still registered in Australia out of that 237,700, 17,000 of which were in Victoria, which equates to about 38%. And as of 2023, there were only 2,004 AU Falcons left registered in New South Wales. That seems a very, very low number to me. Obviously, there'd be a lot of XR8s and uh, Tickfords and things like that in there, but that seems like an extremely low number. And I think what that does to me is it reinforces why it's important that we save our Australian cars. And if you do see a nice example or one that's worth preserving, you know, or doing up, it's well worth, um, you know, grabbing your own little slice of Aussie uh, automotive history. So anyway, that's the story on the AU Falcon. So that was the AU episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Very controversial car, but it seems to be becoming more popular with age, uh, becoming more accepted. Anyway, please give the episode a thumbs up, hit that subscribe button, and make sure you look at the whole Falcon playlist so you can see the history from XK right through. Thanks for watching, bye. Must be stuck in third. One six leads the pack with more space, the most power, and better resale than Commodore, Camry, or Magna. Ford Falcon. With new models on the way, the Falcon runout is on. Huge runout deals across the range. XR, Gear, Futura, S, and Wagons. Falcon Classic. Standard Auto, Air, and over three and a half thousand dollars of free extras. Alloy wheels, spoiler, ABS, and more. Get into Australia's Superior Six. The Ford Falcon runout.